30 years in this industry. Yeah, man, you know, it's funny. So my son, my youngest son is 14 now. That's how old I was when I started. You know, I'm 44 now, I look at him, and I think all the things that were going on around me at that time and what it was like starting, and now I can't imagine that, that that's what happened. But at the time, it felt very natural, and it felt very safe, even though it was not. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm just grateful, man, like, to be able to do something like this for 30 years. I, I gotta be one of the luckiest people alive, man. Like, I, I don't know that I've ever really had a, any other job. How old were you when you made your first TV development deal? 19. My mother and my grandmother were freaked out. You know, I was the first person in my family not to go to college that had not been a slave. Right. <laughs> so I was really breaking from tradition. And uh, it was like a graduation lunch we were having. And they had my dad come and talk to me, and my dad takes me outside and he's like, listen, and this is some advice that applies to all of you acting students. He says, to be an actor is a lonely life. Everybody wants to make it and you might not make it. And I said to my dad, well, well that depends on what making it is there. He was a smart, smart ass kid. Yeah. It depends on what making it is there. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a teacher. I said, if I can make a teacher salary doing comedy, I think that's better than being a teacher. And he started laughing. He said, if you keep that attitude, I think you should go. He said, but name your price in the beginning. If it ever gets more expensive than the price you name, get out of there. Mm -hmm. Thus, Africa. <laughs> When Martin Lawrence was in that chair, we talked about Blue Streak. I love that too. He played a role in your life, I believe. How do you feel about him as a person, as an artist? Martin Lawrence is the guy that showed everybody you can make it from D.C. to Hollywood. And uh, I had a personal stake in his success. Every time he did something, it made me feel inspired and really good. And he was always real nice to me. He'd sit me down, what's going on with you, baby boy? What, what? We'd talk about comedy, whatever. And, uh, you know, when we did Blue Streak, we were promoting it, you know, and Martin had a stroke. He almost died. And then after that, I saw him, and I was like, oh, my God, Martin, are you okay? And he said, I got the best sleep I ever got in my life. <laughs> That's how tough he is. So let me ask you this. What is happening in Hollywood that a guy that tough will be on the street waving a gun, screaming, they are trying to kill me. Yeah. What's going on? Why is Dave Chappelle going to Africa? Why does Mariah Carey make a $100 million deal and take clothes off on TRL? It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. There ain't no weak people talking to you. So what is happening in Hollywood? Nobody knows. The worst thing to call somebody is crazy, is dismissive. I don't understand this person, so they're crazy. That's bullshit. These people are not crazy. They're strong people. Maybe the environment is a little sick. You know, in the past, I used to always tell a lot of jokes about white people. And I know there's a lot of white people here with us tonight. Good evening, whites. Everybody knows what it's like to be embarrassed or to be feel marginalized. The implication is authority. Nobody likes authority figures. When I say jokes about white people, don't think for a second that I'm talking about you. Don't forget, I almost had $50 million once. When you make enough money in America, they'll pull back the curtain and introduce you to the real white people. <laughs> you guys just think you're white. Dave Chappelle. 
is very intelligent. He's well raised. That goes without saying. A person who is well raised knows to to respect the elders. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with anything, even a little bit of what the elder says, but you respect the elder for surviving. It's so much bigger than money, though, Dave. It's so much bigger than money. Oh, no, it was bigger than money. But you know what? I, I watched one of these nature shows one time, and they were talking about how a bushman finds water when it's scarce. Mm -hmm. And they do what's called a salt trap. I, I, I didn't know this. Apparently, baboons love salt. Okay. So they put a lump of salt in a hole, and they wait for the baboon. The baboon comes, sticks his hand in the hole, grabs the salt. Salt makes his hand bigger, and he's trapped. He can't get his hand out. Now, if he's smart, all he does is let go of the salt. Baboon doesn't want to let go of the salt. Then the bushman just comes, takes the baboon, throws him in the cage, and gives him all the salt he wants. And then the baboon gets thirsty. The bushman lets him out of the cage. The first place the baboon runs to is water. Bushman follows him, and they both drink to their fill. And in that analogy, I felt like the baboon. But I was smart enough to let go of the salt. Well, veteran of comedy, people look to you to kind of clear the fog that we as Americans go through. Do you, I know you take that seriously, but is that a big burden on you, that people look to you for clarity, they look for you for truth? I think that it's a symptom of just how maybe bankrupt our society is right now, that, we, that we're looking to our entertainers for this type of guidance. But when things are obscure, artists do try to tell the truth. Sometimes it's not that they're looking for the truth. Sometimes they just want to hear their truth come out of somebody else. Like, why don't, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't look at it as a burden or I don't even look at it as a responsibility. I just think it's the nature of the genre. And I think that one of the things that's special about our genre in this day and age is that it's very engaging, it's very personal. And I think in this cyberspace world that people need an entertainer that looks them in the eyes and says the things that they, they feel. For all the things that I've done, I'm most renowned for what I didn't do. I, I've made decisions in my career that a lot of people have called insane. 2004, had a $50 million deal on the table, and in a crisis of conscience, flipped the table over and walked away. Went to South Africa. Everyone said I was running away from the money. That is not true. In fact, I still want that money. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that I wanted to just share with you guys is the idea that sometimes you you do what you think is best, uh, whether anybody understands it or not. I heard a story about my father where someone told me he used to do statistics for a company in D.C. The company he did statistics for started doing business with the South African government, so he quit his job. It's caused a lot of problems between his, him and his wife. It's hard for a man when he can't provide for his family the way he wants to. And he suffered through it. And a generation later, when I had my crisis of conscience, I was able to go to a free South Africa and get away from the heat. This idea that what you do in your lifetime informs the generations that comes after you is something I keep thinking about, something that is so much bigger than just ourselves. I just want, I just want, I just want you guys to remember, you know, that right now there's this thing where where ethics aren't what they used to be. This idea that people are trying to replace the ideas of good and bad with better or worse. And that is incorrect. You gotta keep your ethics intact because uh, good and bad is a compass that helps you find the way. And a person that only does what's better or worse is the easiest type of person to control. They are a mouse in a maze that just finds the cheese. But the one who knows about good and bad will realize that he's in a maze. This is my last question for you. You don't do many sit-down TV interviews. Why is that? Because, because so much of an answer depends on how you feel any given day. But it lives forever. 
that your opinions about things can change, your view of yourself can change, and yet this is on a permanent record. Like Donald Trump, he complains about it because someone can look at him and say, well, you said in 1984 that this, that, or the other, and, and that's the cross you have to bear when you engage the press. And more important than that, I talk for a living, so I don't want to blather about me blathering. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want to, I'd rather just do it.